Good afternoon. This is Fawn Gordon, and I'm conducting an oral history interview with Florida State Representative Geraldine Fortenberry Thompson. The interview is virtual on October 26, 2021. For the record, would you please state your name and tell us a little about your early life and how you came to live in Orlando, Florida, Representative Thompson. Thank you for uh, the invitation to be with you. As you have mentioned, my name is Geraldine uh, Fortenberry Thompson, and I was born in New Orleans and raised in South Dade County in the town of Perrine. And I uh, attended schools there My uh, up until I graduated from high school. My schools were all segregated. I attended Mays High School uh, in Goose, Florida, and then uh, Miami-Dade College, the Kendall campus, and then uh, the University of Miami in Carl Gables, and left there and relocated to Tallahassee, Florida. While in Tallahassee, I worked for the very first African-American female to ever serve in the Florida legislature, Representative Gwendolyn Sawyer Cherry. While in Tallahassee, uh, my husband was in law school at Florida State University, uh, did some research on where there were very few black lawyers in Florida. And at the time, Florida had only three. So uh, knowing that there would be opportunity, we uh, relocated uh, to Orlando and we have lived uh, in Orlando for almost 50 years. What drew you into political life? Well, there were uh, a number of things, one being my work with Representative Gwendolyn Sawyer Cherry, who was from uh, Dade County. She was a teacher who decided that she wanted to become a lawyer. And she attended the University of Miami Law School for a period of time before transferring to the Florida A&M University Law School which at the time was in Tallahassee. So uh, I was exposed to the political realm uh, working with Representative Cherry. When I moved to Orlando, I was an educator. I taught in the public schools in Orange County for six years and spent 24 years as an administrator at Valencia College. While at Valencia, there were two things that prompted me to consider running for office. One was a program that I started called the College Reach Out Program that brought low income minority students to campus uh, during weekends and during the summer. And in fact, we partnered with the University of Central Florida to give them a college experience that would include living on campus. So they stayed in the dorms at um, UCF during the, during the summer. The program operated uh, very effectively and I raised scholarship dollars locally that were matched by the legislature for more than 10 years. And it afforded these students an opportunity once they finished the program and finished high school to go on to college. For whatever reason, there was a decision made in Tallahassee to discontinue matching uh, the funds. And so I went to Tallahassee, spoke with some legislators, uh, testified in committee, and was told that there was a level playing field in Florida and in the United States, and that there was no need for a program that targeted specifically low-income minority students. Uh, that certainly had not been my experience. So I began to think about running for office. Uh, that was one, one motivator. And the other was I'm the founder of the Wells Built Museum of African American History and Culture. And it's located in a historic building that opened in 1929. It was one of the projects of one of the first black doctors in Orlando William Monroe Wells. He applied for a building permit uh, to build this structure, which was a hotel. 
and he received that in 1926. However, he could not open the hotel until 1929 because he had to self-finance um, due to banks redlining and being unwilling to loan money to an African-American business person. And when I talked with folks in Tallahassee as well as folks locally about starting a museum in this building, I was told that uh, the area was a slum and it was a blighted community and that there was um, crime and drugs and prostitution. All of those things, um, in my opinion, were due to the fact that no one had invested in the community. And when I asked for money from historical resources, I was told that a museum for African-Americans was not necessary because there was a museum already operating and that that museum could fill the need for any focus on African-Americans. That was not the case. And so those two things um, let me know that a different perspective, a different voice was needed in Tallahassee. And I, uh, when I finished my career as an educator, a college administrator, professor, I ran for office. And I was elected to the Florida legislature in 2006. I served in the House from 2006 to 2012, ran for the Florida Senate in 2012, and served there until 2016, and left and came back to the legislature, going back to the House in 2018, where I'm serving today. Um, and how have you continued to sustain the Wells Built Museum? Well, it's been a challenge and particularly uh, during COVID. We had tours that had been scheduled by um, groups from out of town, AARP, church groups, senior citizens centers, all of that evaporated with COVID. So we had um, a year of being shuttered. Uh, we are now, working on a grant proposal to bring in uh, some funds. At the time that we were going through the lockdowns with COVID, we had to cancel any of the events we had inside. We had a Juneteenth celebration outside, but sustaining the Wells bid has been difficult because it's um, a chicken and the egg kind of equation. If you don't have the audience, you don't have the admissions, you can't market. And if you don't market, you don't have the audience. So it has been, uh, it has been challenging. What do you think have been the most important influences in your life of public service? In public service, I, I think the uh, background, my background growing up in a family uh, an extended family where my mother was uh, the oldest girl of 15 siblings. And uh, having seen uh, the effects of lack of access, some of her brothers in particular signed their names with an X because they grew up on a farm in Mississippi where the boys had to work in the fields uh, when my mother was allowed to go to school. And so I saw the difference that education made as well as access and having an advocate and someone to speak up on your behalf. And that's the kind of service that I have worked to give in um, elected office. Um. Were there particular religious or secular institutions that have shaped your philosophy of life? I grew up in the Church of God in Christ. Uh, my mother was a Pentecostal and we went to church a lot. And um, I think one of my earliest reading material uh, was the Bible. And so I had guidance and parameters that came from the teachings in the Bible 
that uh, have shaped a lot of a lot of my life, and particularly as it relates to being responsible for your fellow man and extending the hand and entertaining strangers because you could be entertaining angels unaware. What led you to work on the centennial commemoration for the Okoe massacre? For too long, uh, some of the injustices in our society have been obscured, swept under the rug and ignored. And for a hundred years, the story of what happened in Okoe had not fully been told. And I felt that it was important for students, for members of the community, for visitors to understand what happened in Okoe, particularly as it relates to voting rights. And this was all about African-American men wanting to exercise their right to vote. July Perry and Mose Norman, who in 1920 went to the polls in Okoe. And they were members of the Republican Party, which at the time wanted to eliminate racial discrimination and segregation, whereas the Democratic Party at the time wanted to maintain those systems. And so there was an effort to prevent them from voting in Okoe. And Mose Norman came to Orlando to speak with a judge here in Orlando, Judge Cheney, uh, who encouraged him to return and just insist on his right to vote. And so he and July Perry went back to the polls. There was a debate as to whether uh, they paid their poll taxes. They went back to the segregated community, the colored quarters of Okoe, and a mob followed them there and they were armed, members of the mob were armed and they began to shoot in the home of July Perry. He returned fire and two uh, members of the mob, two white men were killed. And so the word of the killing of the two white men spread throughout central Florida and people came from all over to join the mob July Perry was taken from his home and brought to the Orange County Jail in Orlando, but the mob followed and took him out and hung him because he wanted to exercise his constitutional right to vote. So I wanted to elevate this story and to talk about how important the right to vote is. Sometimes I talk to people who say that it doesn't matter if they vote. And my response is if it didn't matter, people would not be trying so hard to keep you from voting. And so I wanted to focus on the need for us to be politically and socially active and involved. Do you think that the state of Florida and the nation bear responsibility for the Okoe massacre? Oh, I do. Uh, it was the sheriff who allowed the mob to come into the jail to take July Perry out. And the people who should have been protecting that community in Okoe took no action. And so I think that yes, the state of Florida, because of some of its elected leaders, and the involvement of those elected leaders in the massacre that occurred, I think that the state of Florida has some responsibility and through the work of some of our legislators, um, particularly uh, Senator Randolph Bracey, there are now scholarship dollars for the descendants of Okoe as a means of reparation. Do you think the Okoe massacre commemorative efforts are adequate or did you hope for more? Well, I had hoped for more. We had a bill um, 
in going through the legislature focused on teaching the history of the Holocaust. We also had a bill related to teaching uh, about the Okoye massacre and it was not moving, had not been put on the agenda, um, had not been um, scheduled for discussion. And because I saw the bill moving on Holocaust, I amended the Holocaust bill and added into it the history of the Okoye massacre. So it is now required instruction in the state of Florida and so many other things need to be required. The assassinations of Harry T. Moore and his wife, Harriet Moore in Mims, Florida. We know about Rosewood, uh, but not enough. Today, I was interviewed by reporters regarding the Groblin Four, because yesterday, the state attorney for the fifth judicial circuit in Florida made a motion that will go before a judge asking that the indictments against the Groveland Four uh, be eliminated. Two of the men were killed, were murdered. One as he tried to run and get out of Florida had not been arrested, had not been tried, but had been indicted uh, for rape. And so that's an injustice that needs to be reversed. Uh, another of the men was killed after a second trial was ordered by the United States Supreme Court. He was killed by the sheriff on the side of the road. Again, he never got the second trial, uh, was never proven guilty, but the indictment stood. And so I am very encouraged because I filed legislation in 2014 to exonerate uh, the Groveland Four. And it got little or no traction. And I bought 40 copies of the book, Devil in the Grove. And I gave them to the Florida senators as gifts. And many of them, most of them read it. So that the second time when I introduced it, it did move, but it was not, it did not pass. In 2017, the state of Florida issued an apology for the racial injustice that had occurred uh, and that was done to the Global and Four. So for seven years, I've been working, as you say, the arc is long, but it bends toward justice. And so that story, needs to be told and has not been told adequately. And uh, I think there's so much of our history that deliberately has been left out that we have to go back and claim it, go back and fetch it as the African word Sankofa signifies. Would you tell us what the African word Sankofa does signify? It signifies go back and fetch it. And the symbol is a bird that flies forward, but its head is turned backward uh, with an egg uh, in its mouth, uh, going back to fetch those things that we have uh, intentionally or unintentionally left behind. And so that is what Sankofa signifies. Um. Why is it important for the state and its citizens to remember the Okoye massacre? Uh, as I said, um, I have been guided from a lot of things that I learned in the Bible. And one of the things that I learned was that there were a people who were fleeing slavery on their way to freedom and they came to what appeared to be an impossible, impassable barrier. It was a body of water. But as they were there contemplating what to do, the water opened up and they were able to cross on dry land, but they were commanded as they crossed to pick up stone. And on the other side, 
used the stones to build a memorial so that they would not forget how they came across. And not only would they remember, but they were told that generations hence would pass the stones and ask, what mean ye by these stones? And they would be able to tell the story. And so we're not supposed to forget in my estimation, and we have to continue to tell the story. We have to continue to remember. The centennial of the Rosewood Massacre, as you mentioned, of 1923 is fast approaching. As a legislator in the Florida House of Representatives, what do you think is the state's responsibility in remembering the Rosewood Massacre and its centennial anniversary? I don't think we should leave it to the state necessarily. I think that some of those of us in the history space need to be elevating the story and talking about what happened and certainly getting resolutions from legislators, um, making sure that this is included in lesson plans, but you don't have people, uh, there are 120 members in the Florida House of Representatives and 40 members in the Florida Senate. And not all of them have a sensitivity for this discussion, for this topic, for this work. And those of us who do, I think need to give them some guidance and show them how they can be involved. Is there anything else you would like to add or expand upon? No, I, I'm just glad that I was um, able to be a participant in the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of uh, recognizing July Perry. I filed legislation that would designate a portion of the road, state road, Silver Star that came through Okoye as the July Julius Perry Memorial Highway. That's kind of like what mean ye by these stones? So that when young people pass by and they see the road marker, the big brown road markers with the gold lettering, uh, we can tell the story. And of course you can't tell the story if you don't know the story. So more of us need to know the story and more of us need to uh, tell the story. Uh, that's what I do. That's the work that I do at the Wellsville uh, and in the legislature for that matter, uh, talking about some of this history that has long been ignored. Thank you very much, Representative Thompson. This is Fawn Gordon with Florida State Representative Geraldine Fortenberry Thompson on October 26, 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Have a good afternoon.